Mariel Heller, the director of tonight's film, is one of those incredible women. Drawing on an Esquire article about the journalist's experience with America's most treasured children's TV host in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Mariel cast the incomparable Tom Hanks, who, as you will soon see, embodies the man Fred Rogers with an unbelievable performance. Marielle was here at TIFF last year with her film, Can You Ever Forgive Me? We couldn't be more excited to have her here again, so please join me in welcoming the director of A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, Marielle Heller. Hi. I'm Marielle Heller. It is my privilege and honor to welcome you here to our world premiere of this movie. That was such a labor of love. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage some of the many, some of the people who worked with me on this movie. Um, Tom Juneau, who is the r amazing writer whose Esquire article inspired this film, is here with us. And our cast, the incredible Chris Cooper. Susan Kalechi Watson. Our very own Matthew Reese. And someone named Tom Hanks. Here they are. I want to keep it short. I just want to um, take a moment in the middle of all of this exciting glitz and glam where we're all vying for reviews and awards and all of these things to remind us of some words of Fred Rogers. Um, he said, it's easy to fall into the trap of believing what we do is more important than what we are, when of course the opposite is true. What we are ultimately determines what we do. In moments like this, it really helps me to call on his words. So thank you. And I hope you enjoy our film. Um, Mariel, I want to start with you and just get your uh, thoughts about what it was like to begin the process of unpacking this icon on screen. Of course, it began with an article and there was a screenplay to work from, but there's something very visual about the film. And of course, Fred Rogers was a TV star. So. What was that like in terms of that process of turning this into a fiction film with Tom in the lead? I mean, I think the first step was really Jody Lee Leipz, our amazing cinematographer, and I sitting down and talking about how we wanted it to feel. I, I kind of always talk about the technical decisions I'm going to make from an emotional point of view. That's how I've always been as a director. Um, and we knew that there's something about watching the original program of Mr. Rogers that just it makes your stomach hurt with that feeling of nostalgia. You see original footage and your heart kind of leaps. And when we, when we discovered using these old tube cameras, we felt like it, it created a look that gave us that same feel. And every decision that we made through making the movie was with the hope that we were going to authentically recreate this world and find a way to make the audience feel close to it um, and not create a distance. So everything from the miniatures to the to the tube camera, the way we filmed the show, to recreating the set, but also in all of our performances that these wonderful actors gave and the way that the scenes were shot, it, the, the purpose was to make the audience feel it and to be close to it. And Tom, Hanks, um, because we have two Toms on stage. <laughs> um, I want to ask you about kind of unpeeling this icon, about uh, what you where you started in terms of creating your portrayal of Fred Rogers. What, was there a thing that you started from? Uh, this really came about because uh, Mari and I had been searching for something that we could possibly do together. And this, this was one of the screenplays that had existed in, in Hollywood and in, around the industry for a very long time. When did you guys first uh, start putting it out? All right, so I read it probably about eight years ago um, <clears throat> for the first time as an example of this, you can control this if you want to, but I, I honestly did not know what it was. 
um, <clears throat> because of the, the nature of the, the Lloyd Vogel and uh, <clears throat> uh, the story with his father. When uh, Mari called and said, we well, have this thing, and I, I said, well, I, I read that a long time ago, but let me take a look at it now because I'll be seeing it somewhat through, through her eyes. Uh, the, thing about, the thing about Fred was is he's instantaneously to almost every adult in America. He is one of two things, a saint or a fraud. And that juxtaposition of, and I think maybe even, you know, Tom experienced that when he was for, first meeting him, is uh, you, can't, you can't be both, you have to be one or the other, because that's the way, that's the way movie life works. <clears throat> it is very analog. And in order to get to that place where I think somehow there we, we never make fun of Fred, uh, we, we slow down in order to listen to him, and even some of the, the physical aspects... Uh, of it um, was always going to be, I think, <clears throat> deconstructing the myth of it in order to show that he's a regular guy that went out to Chinese food. But at the same time, in scene after scene after scene, there, there is this mystery of why, what's his motivation here? You know, it, 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 there, is it because of commerce? No. He, he was the least commercial performer or creator on television. He never sold his toys. He never had commercials. And I think one of the most wonderful things, too, is that he was actually an ordained minister who never mentioned God on his show. Um, so somewhere in the midst of all of that is, is uh, I think, uh, two things, a behavior that has to be found, but also the the, the prism through which Mari and her crew shot this had to be, in this weird way, this two tube cam, this this video camera process of this cheap little set out of Pittsburgh that looks exactly as we remember it, and then at the same time, this guy who is not dressed in his blue shoes, but he is walking around town in New York City and riding the subway, and he's a regular guy, and yet. He's Mr. Rogers. And so. I just want to add, because that was so beautifully said, but one conversation I had with Joanne Rogers over the course of preparing for this movie was we, we had heard, and Noah and Micah had told me, you know, nobody likes it when, an, if nobody from Fred's camp of people likes it when we refer to him as a saint. And it was sort of the first thing people would say is, oh man, he was a saint. And she was the one who really said, you know, if you think of him as a saint, he's not accessible. It's something that we can't attain if, if we're viewing him as a saint. And you need to know he wasn't. He was a person. He walked this earth like the rest of us, and he worked very hard every day to be the person he wanted to be. And we basically took those lines that she said directly and, and had Joanne in the movie say them. Um, and that was important, I think, for building the character as well, is this, this was a human being. This was somebody with a full life and an entire, as complex as the rest of us, but it's easy to think of him as just this saintly, wonderful man who didn't even have to work at it, which is just not true. The other element that I think brings his character so much into relief is the character that you play, uh, Matthew, and, and also that, uh, that you were, I suppose, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> and are you still? <laughs> just joke. Um, and I wanted to ask you about that, that contrast, you know, between where you came from as a somewhat cynical, as we see in the movie, magazine writer, and what you saw in Fred Rogers, and, and how the two of those people brought out each other, brought each other into relief in a way. Um, I think the thing that was special about my experience with Fred was uh, not so much that I saw something in him, but that he saw something in me. Um, he had that ability and he had that determination to see um, what was good and worthwhile and worth bringing out in people and then set about sort of relentlessly uh, achieving that. I mean, that's one of the things that I really, really love about the movie is that it, it captures that about Fred. It captures his discipline. It captures his his sheer relentlessness. I mean, I, I, over the summer, I, I found some emails from 
that first year when I was first uh, being friends with Fred. He, I mean, he sent me, in the course of just a couple of months, he sent me 70 emails that were, that were I mean, ext- you know, they were long. <laughs> uh, the, you know, he had, he had a lot to say and, and was determined to say it. And with me, he, I believe that he saw somebody who, who really needed to be trusted because I, I didn't trust myself. And Fred, Fred gave me that, and it was, um, I mean, it is, it's 20 years later now, and it is one of the, the great lucky breaks of my life that Fred, I was sent to um, do a profile of Fred Rogers. He assessed me far quicker than I assessed him. And, uh, you know, 20 years later, we're, we're, we're talking about him. It's, um, you never know how life works, but it really works well sometimes. And Matthew, what was this like for you? You play a character who is at least initially pretty tough to like, uh, but opens up in really remarkable ways. Well, I mean, you know, as an, as an actor, it's, it's sorry to sound like a cliche, but it, it is a part you, you relish when you read because the, the journey is so great, but, you know, not certainly without its difficulties or its complexity. So it, it, was, it was something I was instantly, you know, drawn to. Um, and... Uh, and I was worried because Tom has incredible hair. <laughs> but I had a wig. Um, I want to ask the, the other actors up here, uh, Susan and, and Chris. Uh, Chris, maybe we'll, we'll start with you in terms of playing the father character. And so many uh, characters in movies have dads who they struggle against. And you just kind of put it all out there. You are that dad that... <laughs> you know, is very hard for a son to live with. And I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about portraying the father in this film. Uh, yeah, I think it kind of involved a lot of dreaming up what is this character about out of, uh, you know, out of New Jersey. And my wife and I spent, some, spent about six years living in New Jersey, so uh, the characters are kind of familiar. But this Jerry, you know, I think he was... He was trapped in the Rat Pack era and uh, <laughs> loved his karaoke, you know, and had a new woman in his life that was constantly aware of how he treated his family and what he walked away from. And um, I think she worked on him. And as he, Jerry, I think Jerry was rather resistant to it. But um, um, just having talked to Tom, you know, I, I realized there were, there were, this was, there were some parallels in, in the relationship to the father that, that I didn't realize. I thought this was, I thought this, this part of the story was totally fictitious, you know, but um, apparently not so. Mm-hmm. You know. All right. And Susan? Mm-hmm. You are also part of this ensemble, which is really about everyone kind of growing together. And you, your character is maybe a little bit more evolved <laughs> than some of the others, perhaps. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your role in this particular uh, story? Good for her. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's interesting, right? These new phases of life. You, you get comfortable in a certain phase of life. You think you have it kind of managed you know, you know your career, you know your husband's career, you know your roles, and then, you know, you take the next step and a baby enters, you know, your family, and, and then things kind of get tossed around and you try to figure out, well, what are the new roles and how much am I still my old self and all these things. And, and, and a lot of times I find, you know, we all know when it rains, it pours, right? So this happens and then all of a sudden the father comes back into the life, you know, and, and there's all these things that are, are like... Um, stirring up something that's, that's riling up what was peaceful, you know what I mean? What was sort of comfortable. And then enter Mr. Rogers, who is someone who gets them to see things from a new perspective and sort of embrace change and, and the discomfort of change. And not to say that discomfort is wrong or don't feel that or hurry up to get out of discomfort. But what is it to sit in it and say, okay, let me... Let me try to um, feel what this is and then, and then see how it evolves and to have patience with myself, with the people around me. 
Um, so that I think she's also a part of that, though she may be, you know, evolved and, and not dealing with what Lloyd is dealing with. There's still this idea of what it is to be patient with yourself and to yeah. allow things to evolve and to allow discomfort and to know yeah. that that's all part of it. Um, so um, I love that, you know, she, like me, loves Mr. Rogers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like backstage, I, I was singing along with the song mm -hmm. and everything. I remember all of this. And I want to ask a little bit about loving Mr. Rogers because I remember when the first image from this film was put online and everybody kind of just breathed a sigh of relief that you were going to be playing Mr. Rogers. You had managed to cast Tom Hanks as Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Somehow, it's like our collective shoulders went down and we felt like we are in safe hands now. And I want to ask the two of you, Mariella and Tom, about what that was. What, what is the thing that Tom Hanks has that made him perfect for this role? <laughs> Can I, can I interject for one second as, All right. as, as someone Please. who neither from the United States or Canada? When you tell people, they go, oh, what's the film about? You go, I, you know, in a very broad stroke, although it's not, if you just want to get out of the room, I go, oh, it's about Mr. Rogers. And they go, oh. And they go, who plays Mr. Rogers? You go, Tom Hanks. And they go, oh. Yes, right? <laughs> it elicits the same sound. Rogers and Hanks elicit the same sound. I've got to say something because we've obviously been talking about this movie a lot in the last few days and I do think there's this kind of thing that happens where everyone goes, oh yeah, I love Tom Hanks, I love Mr. Rogers, this makes perfect sense. And that's, now you guys have all seen it, you've seen this performance and you know that that's not an easy performance to give. That's not something that Tom just walks in and is, Mr. he puts on a sweater and he's Mr. Rogers. That is an incredibly raw, vulnerable performance to give and um, that is, there is effort, behind, in the same way that Mr. Rogers gave effort to be Mr. Rogers and to live his life the way he wanted to live his life, there is effort that went into this performance and there was an incredible amount of trust and it cannot, it has to feel naked to, to give that type of performance where you are so raw and you're being asked to be so vulnerable and what Mr. Rogers was, was present and open in every moment. I mean. That's a hard thing to do for anybody. And so I, I worry because we have this way we talk about this, like, oh yeah, Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers makes sense. And I'm like, no, that, that's actually not giving credit to the transformative performance that you all have seen now. Okay. Sorry, it's true. Let me, can I just tell a quick, quick show business story that one of the reasons, I guess I'm here. It was, uh, it was a night shoot uh, we are in the back lot of uh, Warner Brothers, where they don't actually make a lot of movies anymore. They had Rainbirds and Wind Machines set up because we were going to be shooting a scene in uh, a torrential downpour. There were all the actors who were wearing, dressed in black, and they were carrying umbrellas. <clears throat> and I entered <clears throat> the shot from the end of the street with a submachine gun, and I butchered 12 guys and shot Paul Newman dead. And I thought, God, I hope I get to play Mr. Rogers someday. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'd like to think that between the executioner and the Green Mile and the Nazi killer and saving Private Ryan. It was all leading here. It was all leading up <laughs> to playing the man who created the neighborhood of make-believe. Thank you. Um, I've been told that we are just about out of time, but I do want to open it up just for a couple of questions from you. So we're going to uh, maybe uh, raise the lights a little bit. Thank you. And uh, if you've got a question, and please bring your best questions. And not this is Seriously. more of a, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so, <laughs> okay. We're, where, where? Who, who are we talking about? Who are we talking about? Okay, uh, no, one second, please. Right here? Okay, yes, on the aisle, go ahead. Is that the one you mean? Okay. Tom, do you know who's chosen this question? Go ahead. Yes. I was too young, old, excuse me, I was too old. 
Um, I remember Mr. Rogers as being this odd black and white show on the TV channel we never tuned in uh, uh, when I was growing up. And the puppets, their mouths didn't move, so I didn't know who was talking necessarily. Because when you're 11 years old, you already, you're already piped into what the logic is of being entertained that it has to hit beats and it has to do something very specific and it's got to move fast. So I just thought that it was this weird kind of like black and white community college kind of like production <laughs> that made absolute, well, let me tell you, Mr. I, I never understood what was going on. In the course of watching hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of uh, Mr. Rogers, and look, let, let's not, let's remember, there is a fabulous documentary called um, uh, Won't You Be My Won't Neighbor. You Be My Neighbor? Um, that was, that was a, 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 you know, a font of information. My relationship to him now is, is that I wish that when my kids were younger, and one of my kids is here today, I wish when, when, when my son was three years old that he and I sat down and watched a half hour of Mr. Rogers a, a week because I would have better understood the, the role of a parent in saying to their children, it's all right if you're sad. Because so many parents say, don't be sad. Oh, this will, you'll forget it. Let's, 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 let's divert your attention so you'll be all right over here. The idea that, you, that Mr. Rogers was explaining to confused beings how the world works because they actually had no impression on how the world works. I think that ends up being something that literally no one else does on television and no one else has done that really outside uh, in the media. It's uh, uh, almost anywhere. Not to take, you know, our kids watch a lot of cartoons. But there is this age when they are, as Mr. Roger himself read, most kids at the age of two and a half wonder if they are going to get sucked down the drain when they unplug the bathtub. <clears throat> this is a genuine fear that a lot of kids have. And if I had noticed this, it is physically impossible for you to get sucked down the drain. And you gotta do it in that, at that speed. And he wrote a song about it. And he wrote a song about it, yes, yeah. And also that's got the, the great, <laughs> should I tell this? When my wife and I get into it, when we're done with whatever subject matter that got us all heated up, oh. I'm now driving her insane because I sing. Well, you know, honey, it's good to talk It's good to share the things we feel. It's good to talk. It was, it was our joke on set. Yes. Our AD would say, because of the song, It's Good to Talk, which we all just loved, it would always be, it's good to shoot. It's good to shoot another scene. It's good to, everything was, that was all, the you, whole you shoot. Can, you can turn, just, if you're ever confused, just take a reading from the book of Fred Rogers, yes. and all will be well, or That's you'll so get true. to the next place you need to. Thank you. Um, Balcony, give me a question. One question from up in the balcony, please. Who's got one? I've got one. All right. Uh, the script seems perfect. How come it floated around Hollywood for years? Um, yeah, I mean, I, it wasn't so much that it floated around Hollywood for 10 years, but it took a long time to get made because we were working with the estate, um, who are very, very protective of... Fred Rogers and, you know, his likeness, like, like Tom said, he never, he never sold any toy. He never did any sort of endorsements. And, um, we had sort of written a script and gotten it to them. And they were like, well, we love you guys. Uh, script needs some work. <laughs> and so they opened up the archives to us and we got to read all the letters that, that, you know, the ones that Fred wrote Tom, like, I mean, that's a little invasive, but we read them all, you know, <laughs> before, <I did. laughs> before he did. Uh, and it was like, oh, this is, this is amazing. This guy is actively participating in not only this journalist's life, but in hundreds of other people's lives uh, on a daily basis. And so we, we had to be very careful. And I think we, we were also, um, you know, growing in our own lives and writing about our own kids and our own insecurities about being parents. And it, it took a long time. And it took us a long time to find Mari. <laughs> and when we found Mari, it happened. You know, it happened. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think for us, for Noah and I, um, we've both had the experience of being terrified fathers of young children and staring at our infant girls and, and wondering, what the hell are we supposed to do? How are you supposed to raise a child today? And looking for answers, looking for any kind of authority figure. You know, little kids are just full of just raw feelings. And a lot of the impetus for the story to begin with came from uh, 10 years ago when, when Noah's daughter was two and being a two-year-old maniac and he played a YouTube video of Mr. Rogers. I mean, I was, I was looking for help. I mean, let's be honest, like she was so, so strong-willed. And she, and she calmed down and, and Noah came into our office and he was like, who is this warlock? I have discovered a wizard that speaks toddler. And then, and then in the time that it took us to, to get things right, to work with the estate, to, to, to build this community around this project, um, I had a daughter uh, and of course, we, we raised her on the Daniel Tiger cartoon, the, uh, um, the Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, the, the cartoon version of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And so when we were on set, um, you know, I would FaceTime with her. We were shooting in Pittsburgh. And uh, for her to have an interaction with the puppeteer playing Daniel, uh, uh, it blew her mind. Uh, and she, um, you would think that she'd be very happy, but she burst into tears. Uh, but, uh, but for me, it was a real parent win. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for your questions. We're going to have to leave it there. So I'll just ask you to please join me in thanking the incredible team from A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Tom Juno, Micah Fitzerman Blue, Noah Harpster, Susan Kalechi Watson, Chris Cooper, Matthew Reese, Mr. Tom Hanks, and director Mariel Heller. Thank you, Thank Cameron. You.